Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another show. Today, I have Daniel Mate with me. Daniel is the co-author of The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture that he wrote with his father, Gabor Mate. Coming from a family of Jewish Holocaust survivors, Daniel is a vocal critic of Zionism, Israeli policies, and its genocide in Gaza. Daniel Mate is an award-winning musical theater songwriter, playwright educator, and mental chiropractor. Mate received the Edward Kleban Prize for the most promising lyricist in American musical theater, a Jonathan Larson Foundation grant, and the ASCAP Foundation's Cole Porter Award for Excellence in Music and Lyrics. Daniel, firstly, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I, I no problem at all. Listening to that intro, I'm going to have to probably define what a mental chiropractor is, because it's kind of a hold <laughs> into the other things I do, but... <laughs> well, when you do so many things, you can kind of get lost uh, sometimes and lose track. But hey, we always re refresh our memories sometimes. Um, Daniel, I uh, saw in one of your recent videos, you compared Zionism to addiction, which mm. is something very strong. Mm. And you said that Zionism is there to relieve fear of loneliness, lack of belonging, longing for home, bitterness about how God could betray us, which mm. I found very powerful. Mm. Would you mind elaborating what you what made you say that and, and what is what is it established upon exactly? Yeah. Well first of all I don't want to let any and this is this is just one way of framing it. You know, and there's no there's no one way of talking about a complex phenomenon like an ideology like Zionism which is more than an ideology, it's also a practice and it's a mm. historical legacy now and it's ensconced in an actual country full of many different people and you can't reduce everything to one explanation, but the lens of looking at it as a kind of emotional addiction, like many ideologies can be, we cling to an ideology to help us navigate or cope with a reality that's uh, painful, you know, this is how cults work. This is how a lot of fundamentalisms work, you know? Mm. Um, so I'm just introducing the notion of addiction here. You could call it a metaphor or you could say it's more literal, but I'm not saying that's all it is. But one way of thinking about the emotional hold that it has on people the ways in which people are having a hard time letting go of it in the face of all the evidence that shows that this ideology has proven disastrous, not just for the Palestinians and the larger region, but for us ourselves as Jews. People are still clinging to the notion that this is our salvation. And the definition of addiction that we give in the book, The Myth of Normal, is any any behavior, not a drug or a substance, but any repeated behavior of any kind that results in negative consequences, and yet the person has an inability to stop. And that's always in response to a need to kill some kind of pain or to mm. escape some kind of anxiety. It does mm. something for them, in other words. And mm. whatever else the consequences might be, that's something that it's doing for them is so salient and compelling that they're unable to give it up because they can't imagine getting it from anywhere else. And mm. in the in the case of addictions to substances and behaviors, people who get addicted have very good reason to doubt they're going to be able to get it from anywhere else because they've been hurt, injured, traumatized in the past, and their ability to enjoy life without that behavior or substance of choice, well, so-called choice, uh, has been compromised. So if you take that into the political realm, and I'm using this let's say it's a metaphor or it's just a frame. Zionism emerged as a solution. A solution to what? A solution to what early Zionists called the Jewish problem or the Jewish question. And one of the things mm -hmm. that's 
deeply ironic and sad about that is that we know who else used exactly that kind of language. The anti-Semites of Europe, most yeah. notably the Nazis. Um, and, you know, without, we don't need to go all the way back to the origins of Zionism because Zionism has evolved and morphed over time. But at this point, we're no longer living in the era of pogroms and, you know, massive European anti-Semitism that's threatening Jewish communities. Yeah. We're living in a time where Israel has been established. It's had its effects on that place. Uh, and Israel is now a powerful, powerful country doing the kinds of things that a powerful country can do uh, and having tremendous consequences on another people. And Jews all over the world and people who are not Jewish who are still tied to Zionism are finding it difficult to give it up in the face of a lot of evidence that it's not so good for us. Mm. And so that's why mm. I called it an addiction. There's um, a kind of and how do you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, how how do you overcome that addiction in that case, in your opinion? I'm not sure. Um, mm. People have to want to get better. <laughs> you mm. can't force an addict to give up their addiction. Usually, what happens is that reality imposes upon the addict so they persist in their habit and the habit in the case of Israel is the habit of power that's fed by American and Western foreign policy that gives Israel all kinds of unfair advantages and the ability to um, kind of oppress way above and beyond its actual means I mean Israel's economy without foreign aid is pretty negligible, actually. Um, mm -hmm. what, what the U.S. allows Israel to do is to keep the addiction to power and keep, domination going. Mm, keep going. This is what I felt uh, for, for a very long time, actually. And it's funny because I always felt like th they do behave as addicts and that one of the main problems is that they have someone supporting this addiction 24-7. Yeah. And it's not just the addiction to Zionism itself. It's the addiction to the violence. It's the kick that they get from being superior on other people. It's all of the things that are combined with it that many people don't see with the day-to-day -day life. Like... Uh, this genocide obviously revealed many things and people started to go back to history to see what people used to face on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's, it's changing public opinion massively, really, all across the world. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned you were in a Zionist camp back in the 90s and you immediately had a change in mind or of heart uh, after you've been to that camp. Before that event that I think was in 1997, did you describe yourself as a Zionist and then you changed your mind after that or how, how was it exactly? No, it wasn't immediate. It wasn't an event. There, there was no turning point. It was a gradual mm. process. And I was never deeply... Um, convinced or persuaded by the Zionist case, but it was just the default. I was, I was born into the Jewish North American world and overwhelmingly, almost unilaterally, or excuse me, uh, unanimously, I should say, North American Jews were pro-Israel, which ranged from just being vaguely sympathetic to Israel, having a cultural affiliation, feeling like it's a part of our Jewish world and buying into many of the founding myths of Israel which is to say that it's the underdog, that it's all alone, that it wants peace and the Arab countries don't, and the Palestinians don't accept it, all the way to a more kind of fervent right wing, this land is ours and we're going to take it by force kind of thing. I was on the left wing side of it. Plus, I came from a family where my father had had his own anti-Zionist awakening when he was a college student or so and had never bought into Zionism ever since then. So in my whole life, it's not like I was indoctrinated into Zionism at home. And yet, I had a father, a 
family who sent me to this camp, not to indoctrinate me into Zionism, but because the Zionism was just one feature of a much bigger kind of curriculum of pretty positive, pro-social, socialist, progressive, secular, Jewish, good vibes kind of things that this camp taught. It was a kibbutz uh, model sort of summer camp where we felt a great deal of ownership over our own labor. We served our own breakfast to each other. We did our own laundry. We learned about values like consensus building and group decision making. It was a beautiful place to go to summer camp and a really nice counterpoint for me to, um, you know, the um, school in the city where I was one of very few Jews. Being around Jewish people at summer camp was a really warm and beautiful part of my upbringing. And the fact was that the overall educational framework of the camp was Israel at the center of our Jewish life. So mm. that's what I was surrounded by. I always had a certain degree of resistance to it, even as a little kid, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. I could sense that there was something about the nationalism that was asking something of me that I didn't want to give, which is a kind of to turn my identity over to some country that I'd never been to and to some concept called Zionism, some group identity that didn't feel quite like home to me. And they were telling me, this is your real home, you know, uh, but it wasn't the kind of thing where I would be kicked out of the camp if I didn't fully drink the Kool-Aid, but I sipped the Kool-Aid, you know, <laughs> I, 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 mm. I, I sipped the Kool-Aid, I didn't quite drink it. And then as you get older and older, then they start putting the they, they start putting the gears to you a bit more. Oh, are you going to go on the Israel year-long program after high school? Are you going to become a summer camp counselor? And we would jokingly um, say to each other, oh, we're being brainwashed or we're brainwashing the kids or whatever. And there was a kind of knowing, winking irony to it because many of us were in this position of, look, we're actually safe in North America. We're not, like whatever they're telling us about like, Israel being the safe place for Jews to go when the next Holocaust comes, we weren't seeing the next Holocaust around the corner. We were fine. Mm. Yeah, we got picked on at school sometimes because we had different traditions, but that's no different than the Muslim kids in our class. You know, mm. we were an ethnic minority. So summer camp was offering a particular view of the world in which Israel is the solution to an imagined problem that we have, which is that we don't belong anywhere. And I never liked that because I liked not belonging. To me, I... To me, being Jewish in North America was a kind of belonging to a people that has thrived in exile, or at least in diaspora. And I didn't like this notion of getting us all together in a certain country. And at the same time, mm. we had Israeli counselors, we learned Israeli songs, we learned Hebrew. You learn another culture, you get to know things about it that seem appealing. I never liked the army stuff. That always creeped me out because I was a pacifist kid. So something about that I was allergic to. So mm. it was a complicated thing. Then I get to be a summer camp counselor after spending 10 months in Israel on an actual kibbutz, which didn't do anything to warm me to Israel as a place. I mean, I, I got to know the land, but I didn't come away from 10 months in Israel any more Zionist than I had been. In fact, I came away with a lot more questions than I had had because I started to feel this sort of low-key, latent racism of the place, even if people weren't saying mm. these things the absence of Palestinians in the conversation, the fact that our program didn't really take us to, didn't take us to the West Bank at all, didn't learn about what was happening in Gaza, 20 kilometers away from our kibbutz. There was a kind of silence that started to feel like I was living maybe in the Jim Crow South or something like that. Like, who am I not seeing, you know? Mm. And at the same time, Israelis as people, I got to know them, I got to speak Hebrew better. So it, again, it kind of all, balanced out. I wasn't against it, but I certainly wasn't for it. And I was learning more and more about what the Palestinians had been through. So that was tilting the scales in a different direction. And then becoming a counselor and being like, well, what am I going to teach kids here? What what actual influence do I to have? And the more I rose up in the ranks of seniority there, the more I realized I can't just keep t telling this same old story about freedom and independence in 1948 without mentioning what I'm learning about the Nakba, without talking about the brutality of the occupation, without talking about the Eurocentric racism of the early Zionists. 
And the more mm. I tried to bring that stuff in, the more pushback I got. Now, there was more room for that stuff by the time I was that age than there had been in the 1980s when I was a kid, because fundamentally, this was a youth group that was trying to have it both ways, Zionism and progressivism at the same time, socialism mm. and tribalism. And ultimately, mm. these values are going to be in collision with each other. Now, there are, like I said, parts of huge parts. In fact, the mainstream parts of the North American Zionist Jewish world would not have tried to pretend that they were progressive or socialist. It would have just been our people, our country, our language, our flag, our army, yeah, 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 rah, 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 a more openly fascist kind of approach as depicted in the movie Israelism. I was going to this weird hybrid of, you know, people who are hanging on to the labor Zionist vision of a kind of egalitarian Zionist vision. And I was kind of right at the crux of those two opposing tectonic plates that ended up kind of clashing. And so ultimately, by the time I left, I decided, well, if I have to choose one value over another, it's not going to be Zionist going to be universal human rights it's going to be peace it's going to be justice that's where i actually identify more and that's where my jewishness leads me to identify more then i go to university i start meeting other jews who feel the same way i start meeting actual palestinians and for me it was over at that point mm. i had an argument in my book about the one state solution that I don't have a fundamental problem with Zionism per se as an ideology for Jewish belonging to the land of Israel or Palestine and them liking to live there. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. What I do have a problem with is a supremacist, ethnocratic, apartheid, neo-colonial, violent ideology that imposes itself on you. Mm -hmm. And the problem that you have with Zionism nowadays is that we have never seen that other good side of Zionism. That's the main problem. When you spoke about the most hopeful period of uh, Zionism, it was in the early 90s with Yitzhak Rabin, and we all know how that ended. Mm -hmm. And there was a genuine hopeful situation in Israel at the time. You had hundreds of thousands protesting in Israel for peace, for a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. He had potential talks not only with the Palestinians, but with the Syrians as well. Mm -hmm. There was a, a general feeling that, you know, we're going to get this sorted. Mm -hmm. With all our criticism about the two-state solution, the lack of core things that, they, that it doesn't address with regards to the refugees, etc. However, there was something going on there assassinated in a very shady assassination and ever since that point moving forward you've seen it going more and more towards more extreme and more extreme and more extreme yeah. right now you have this genocide and this conflict and everything is um, on the headlines in your opinion is there a prospect to combine some elements of zionism or love of the land of Israel and Judaism being there and potentially even participating politically and having political participation that is not imposed against the will of the indigenous population moving on? What a great question. A few things I just want to bring out of the question, the framing of the question itself, and then I'll try to answer sure. the substance of it. Um, number one, you're right that the early 90s were the period where things felt the most hopeful. I think a careful reading of the history will show that even the exalted Yitzhak Rabin was not particularly serious about creating any sort of Palestinian state. I mean, privately he said, that's not happening. What they were trying to create was a process by which Israel could consolidate its occupation in a kinder, gentler way and give the Palestinians some kind of limited autonomy, which I don't think ever would have lasted because Palestinians, like any other people, wouldn't be satisfied with such a um, half measures non-solution to their legitimate national aspirations and grievances. But at least it looked good. And I remember calling my dad from the kibbutz when I was living there, being like, they signed the, they're going to sign the agreement on the lawn of the White House. And my dad said, this isn't worth the paper it's written on. Right? Or as Edward Said said, it's all process. Wow. 
Yeah, and that that I was quite crestfallen by that, but he, they, he turned out to be right. Um, and I like what you said about how in and of itself as an ideology, you don't have to object to that, right? Jews having a connection to a particular land, wanting to find a way to live there. You can have sympathy for the Jewish need for refuge and a desire to return to a place that they have some historical connection to. In the abstract, that's great, but politics does not exist in the abstract and it never did. So Zionism was never just a free-floating ideology of what should happen. Well, I guess actually, I mean, originally Herzl would have taken Uganda. He didn't actually care about Palestine. Mm. But even that, I mean, then you'd have to ask the Ugandans how they feel about that. You know, that would be mm. a, been a whole other can of worms. Um, but the, per, the, the point is, when you have a group of white Europeans um, with an ideology that says, we want to gather someplace where we currently aren't, let's find a place. Well, that immediately runs into facts on the ground. So th there is no ideology outside of politics. And what the earliest Zionists recognized, it's not like, and what they recognized was that you couldn't do that without displacing a massive part of the Palestinian population to create an ethnographically Jewish state, which is the ultimate political expression of Zionism. You would have to displace, expel, ethnically cleanse Palestine. Mm. And, oh, sorry, yeah. expel and uh, displace and expel its um, its inhabitants. Now, there were so-called cultural Zionists who were seeking exactly the kind of implementation of a much more benign and humanistic and egalitarian um, ideology than philosophy, such as you're explaining. People like Judah Magnus, Ahad Ha'am, Albert Einstein was of this persuasion, which is why he turned down the presidency of Israel, the first presidency, and said, if we can't learn to live in peace and equality with our Arab neighbors, then we've learned nothing in our 2,000 years of suffering. So that was one possibility, but it was completely swept under the rug and overwhelmed by the racist version of Zionism, which said, no, if it's not a Jewish state, then it's not the fulfillment of our national aspirations. And a Jewish state means majoritarian Jewish, ethnically, demographically. And the only way to do that, even in the UN partition plan of 1947, the Jewish state that was allotted to the Jews on a majority of the land was not majority Jewish. So there was a demographic problem. And the only way to solve it was the way the Zionists did solve it. And the most honest Zionists were the ones who said, get out, get your head out of the ideological sand and admit that what we are is colonists. And this is a colonizing mm. project. And when you're going to do that, that's where the notion of superiority comes from. I mean, racism didn't start with racism in Europe. Racism was a necessary uh, lubricant for the material aspirations of conquest and imperial domination. They wanted the resources, they wanted the power, they wanted to govern the world and the territory. How are you gonna do that if, that if the world and the other territories of the world are populated by human beings who are just as human as you? Well, they must not be human beings. Mm. They must not have those rights. You have mm. to make yourself superior in order to justify that. Well, why are you justifying it in the first place? Because you're afraid of where you are, you don't have enough, you're running out of arable land, you're running out of resources, or you've come upon an ideology called endless expansion, capitalism, individualism that separates you from other people and from the earth and says, we have to dominate. So the, the two go hand in hand. So it's very, very difficult to separate political Zionism, which has as its goal, a majoritarian Jewish state from an ethno-supremacist view. And mm. if a two-state solution ever was possible, it's no longer possible. No one takes that seriously anymore. Israel's made that absolutely clear. Now, is it possible to salvage some of the more benign aspects of, I'd say, cultural Zionism? Sure, you can love a land, but you gotta love it and not wanna overrun it, because if you love it, then you gotta love its people. And the people who have been tending to it for thousands of years when some of us were there, there were Jews there all along, right? Palestinian yeah, Jews, Arab of course. Jews, but it wasn't the European Jews. 
So you'd have to come as a guest first and learn its ways. Mm. Mm. Um, there's lots of beautiful things about the Hebrew language, you know, and the way modern Hebrew has become its own source of poetry and literature and all that. I'm sure there's a lot to salvage there. Um, and yeah, but it would have to, it would have to uproot itself from its roots of being separatist in the sense of we come here and we will not integrate with these people. We're going to set up our own settlements, outposts of essentially European white dominance until such time as we can drive the inhabitants out of their homes and their homeland, which is exactly what they did as Ilan Pape, the Israeli historian, details in the book, the yes. of Palestine and so on and so forth. So the love of the love of Zion, I mean, we'd have to get spiritual with it too. I mean, that's Zion is a spiritual concept. It's not just a place. And as a lot of wonderful Jewish commentators of these days, Shaul Magid, as Alon Mizrahi, other people have said, it's possible to be in a place but not really be there it's possible to be physically returned to an original homeland yet to still spiritually be in exile and that to mm. me sums up sums up israel perfectly they're there but they're mm. not really there they're still mm. trying to own it and have it belong to them rather than belonging to it so it would take mm. a complete reframe and i don't think that can exist until the state of Israel as it's currently conceived as a Jewish state is dismantled and recycled and composted into something mm, that is formal. That's powerful. Mm, that's powerful. So you mentioned you grew up in the North American Jewish community uh, that was primarily pro-Israel at the time. Mm-hmm. Do you still feel is, like there's but a, still, still, is, but, still but a lot less monolithically? So, so, so this is what I wanted to ask. Ha- has there been a shift at all in the past six months in the particularly North American Jewish community? Well, the shift has made itself known in the past six months, but that's only because it's been happening for the past 20 years. Mm. It, it didn't just happen on October 7th, but October 7th gave enough of a jolt to those who had already, many people had already started to change their minds. Because Israel has been showing its true face. Norman Finkelstein wrote a book 15 years later called Knowing Too Much, The Coming Breakup of American Jewry with Israel, or some such, I'm mm. paraphrasing the title, but it's like that. And he basically said, look, fundamentally, American Jews are liberals. They support civil rights. They support progressive causes, right? They're into human rights. We work for NGOs. Generally speaking, most North American Jews, except maybe the wealthiest ones, but even some of them are democratic voters and like to think of themselves as fairly progressive people. Well, the more lunatically uh, right-wing and overtly racist Israel gets, the more the left-wing tranche of Israeli society gets wiped out and replaced by just a center-right to ultra-right mini-spectrum, which is what's happened since the Second Intifada at the end of the 90s. The Israeli left wing kind of just gave up, threw up its hands and said, oh, well, if you can't be mm. joining, the Palestinians mm. don't want peace. You know, uh, the, the disillusionment with Oslo led to a kind of doubling down on, well, what are you going to do? The Palestinians, you can't deal with these people. So they just joined the racism and ethno-supremacy of the right. Well, the more that happened, the harder it is for North American Jews who see themselves as liberal and progressive to side with this foreign country with which they don't identify. The culture is very different. You know, uh, Mm. it's not a place of bagels and self-deprecation. It's a place of, you know, slight variations on falafel and and, uh, (laughs) kind kind of Sen- sentimental brutality uh, coming out of everyone doing the Israeli army, everyone, you know, forced conscription. That's nothing like us here in North America. We're, we're nebishes, we're nerds, we're <laughs> intellectuals <laughs> and artists, you know. So culturally already there was a split and there was less and less to sympathize with and to identify with. Plus, 
being Jewish in North America just didn't give us that sense of panic where we would need a plan B. So young mm. Jews, the generation that came up, especially millennials, I mean, I'm Gen X, I'm going to say sort of young end of Gen X. Yeah, the mm. younger generation just didn't see what Israel was for. It's like a weird place. And many of them did birthright and that got them hooked. But many people did birthright and actually saw through it, like being there with tour guides as Israeli you know, with Israeli soldiers as tour guides carrying machine guns. It was just offensive to their sensibilities. The movie Israelism mm. is a great uh, chronicle for those who haven't seen it. I really recommend it. It's a documentary. It'll show you how this disillusionment, this breaking free from the illusions of Zionism has been happening for a good amount of time. Yeah. Now, every now and then, there would be Israeli so-called operations, really massacres in Gaza, which the Israeli army would or the government would refer to as mowing the lawn with with names that sound like condom brands, Operation Protective Edge, Operation Black <laughs> Lead, Operation Pillar of Defense, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I prefer Al-Aqsa Flood I, 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 when it comes to names of operations. <laughs> uh, uh, although I guess that could, be, that could sound erotic too if you want. But the, point, <laughs> but the point is, every now and then you get this massacre of Palestinian civilians and a laying to waste of Palestinian civil infrastructure or the mm. Great March of Return, where Israelis were sniping disabled Palestinians, you know, on crutches and wheelchairs walking towards the wall. And we get uncomfortable, but it would usually be pretty quick. 51 days, I think, was the longest one, you know. Yes. Well, then October 7th happened. And I think the shock that Israel suffered of having its wall of impenetrable defense breached and mm. such, such a, a completely colossal mess up on the part of its army and government, if you accept it as a mess up, some people want to get conspiratorial and say that it was fully planned or known about. But either way, and the immediate shift into a kind of genocidal rhetoric broadcast to the entire world in the age of social media hearing Netanyahu talk about Amalek well we know our Old Testament we know how mm. brutal some of those stories are and seeing the entire Jewish world around us bunker down into a kind of paranoid pre-justification for whatever Israel is about to do we felt it coming and, you know, by October 8th, the day after, I was at a rally of Jews, uh, excuse me, Jewish Ju Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, two Jewish American groups that had been building membership for years. And here was our moment to come out. And there were thousands of us out in the street near Chuck Schumer's apartment in Brooklyn. And then very soon after that, they shut down Grand Central Station mm. in New York City and the Statue of Liberty. I mean, so major shift. Not that the ideological shift has all happened in the past six months, although a lot of people have made that shift. It's accelerated yes. it. It's increased it probably exponentially. But that's only because the activism on the ground, the organizing, had already been taking place, except that now was our moment to come out and make our voices known. But, you know, activism movements take a long time to build. And this one's been building. Mm. I feel like it has been building, but I personally, monitoring previous wars and activism globally, I felt like this was a very big moment and I did personally witness a big shift oh, in absolutely. terms of the numbers, the activism, the yeah. levels, particularly in North America, of uh, Jewish people protesting on their own, in many cases, their mm -hmm. own protests of massive Jewish people, not in my name, in so many locations. To me, that's unprecedented. I saw many Jewish people. When we were in Israel, when we were protesting, you had Jewish Israelis with you, or some Jews who would describe themselves as Jewish Palestinians, by the way. Yeah. So to me, that's nothing new. It's just that the level, really, the level of uh, Jewish participation and activism in North America, in my opinion, this time was unprecedented. And this could be well due to the shift in some people doing a 180 when it comes to their whole view about Israel and Zionism.
I think you're absolutely uh, right. And, and, and I think that one of the major um, manifestations of that shift is people being willing to go against their own families. Yes, their own local this is something very important. Their own synagogues, breaking off and forming their own groups. I mean, you see something like, I don't know if you're familiar with the activism being done in Teaneck, New Jersey, but Teaneck for Palestine is a group that cropped up and one of their most eloquent spokespeople um, was uh, or is a Jewish man named, I think, Rich Siegel. I hope I'm getting mm. his name right. And he gave the most incredible speech to city council. And it was about an upcoming sale or auction of West Bank property at a local synagogue. Mm. And he came out and said, I'm Jewish. I have Holocaust victims in my lineage. And there is an illegal sale of foreign occupied stolen property happening at a religious facility in my community. Mm. And I'm urging you to stop it. Now that's a kind of, you know, skin in the game activism and putting bodies on the line activism that's been replicated all over the country by Jews and non-Jews, people going to weapons facilities and blocking shipments at ports in, in Oakland or whatever um, that we haven't seen before. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I saw uh, <clears throat> that video of this rabbi speaking. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't a rabbi, but... He wasn't a rabbi. Was the one wasn't I mentioned he, was just a, a local guy, but there are plenty of rabbis who spoke. I, th I think the other one probably was in Canada. It was one of these liberal rabbis uh, protesting out of it because it, it yeah, took place David, in multiple synagogues. I think you're talking about David Mebasser, who is a family friend. He used to be the yes. rabbi of my parents' synagogue in Vancouver. Oh. And he's been a Palestine advocate for decades. And mm. um, But this is, again... This is a moment where voices like that can get a lot of traction. He was helping organize protests in Hamilton, Ontario, where actually mainstream Jewish groups were trying to get the screening of the film Israelism that mm. I mentioned to you earlier mm. canceled. Mm. And they did mm. manage to get it canceled, but groups like the one David was speaking for managed to get it rescheduled. And they ultimately mm. couldn't, couldn't shut it down because mm. the demand was too much. People wanted to mm. see it. Mm. Yet, despite all of this increasing activism from the Jewish community in the U.S., in the U.K., in other parts of the world, even inside of Israel, they still don't highlight on mainstream media this level of activism and criticism of Israel. Why do you think they don't show it? Well, the mainstream media, you know, one of the advantages I had in my political awakening, even while I was going to Zionist summer camp, was having been shown the documentary about Noam Chomsky's work on the media, manufacturing mm. consent from, uh, I think, 1991. I watched that in high school. And it shows how the mainstream media works. And Israel is a perfect case example of that, the way it covers Israel. Basically, it accepts the premises and the frameworks of whatever U.S. foreign policy dictates. And... In the case of Israel, there's also the strong influence of the Israel lobby that influences the government, which in turn influences mainstream <clears throat> media, right? So you have this situation where there's just the bounds of debate are very circumscribed. You can't go outside of them. And to ignore, it was the same thing with the Iraq war. They totally marginalized the massive amount of protests. It was much less covered than the Vietnam War protests, even though they were the largest since then. Phil Donahue was fired from MSNBC, the allegedly liberal station, for coming out against the war on moral and legal grounds. Mm. So ma mainstream media always filters things along certain ideological lines that it won't admit are there. It'll tell you mm. it's a free, a free press, but it's an optical illusion. Mm. So when it comes to Jews protesting um, what Israel is doing, but really protesting what the U.S. government is doing by enabling Israel's addiction to violence and power. And violence, totally. Which is now out of control. We're an inconvenient uh, wrench in the, in the narrative gears. 
So of course it gets ignored. Now, sometimes you, you, you can't ignore it entirely, but when they would report on say the Grand Central Station reports, they would neglect to mention that these were Jewish groups. They'd just say, you know, protesters disrupted traffic at Grand Central Station. Mm. With, you know, and then they would insinuate that there was anti-Semitism among the crowd. Not Absolutely. Saying, not saying that these are Jewish groups, not comment, not reporting on the fact that Jewish Voice for Peace, not just uh, uh, whatever students for justice in Palestine were uh, banned from Columbia campus on mm. the grounds of anti-Semitism. So we just fall into a category where we're inconvenient. Now, I did see recently that when the group standing together, which is a group of Israeli and Palestinian citizens, uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinian citizens of Israel came on a speaking tour to North America, they did get to be on Joy Reid's show on MSNBC. And that's understandable because that's an inspiring story of coexistence and working together. And that group tactically on purpose, I think, because they're trying to speak to Israelis, doesn't approach things in terms of not in our name. Um, well, at least they don't call it necessarily a genocide. They just talk about equality, justice, and they try to speak to Israel's um, sort of concerted self-interest about this. This will not bring us security. Mm. And we need to live together. And those are those statements are general enough and in some ways vague enough, but also kind of hopeful enough that a network like MSNBC can allow that to come through. And I'm not mm. throwing shade at that group because I think they're doing work inside of Israel that's important to soften the attachment to yeah, the policy. Absolutely. But that's the kind of outer limit of what's allowable on US mainstream media. Mm, but they won't bring you the raw, genuine, authentic, blunt, in your face, I'm against all of this from the get go. And it's it's uh, interesting that you spoke about softening that and the fact that some people in Israel, including many people who consider them, themselves Zionists, do not have the same approach when it comes to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. He has had his own way during this genocide. He's going against the head of the Mossad, previous heads of the Israeli intelligence and military establishment, against everyone really, and he has his own way. And obviously it's led by Benjamin Netanyahu, but my argument is that Israel as a state enables it. So if it wasn't Netanyahu, someone else could have committed the genocide. That's my argument. But what's your take about Benjamin Netanyahu so far and how, in your opinion, where are we headed to with his, th with his threats against Rafah and all of this international pressure and obviously the success of the Palestinian resistance and the perseverance of the Palestinian people against this genocide? Well, I'm neither a political nor a military analyst, so I tend mm. to refrain from predictions. Um, mm. In terms of Netanyahu, you know, coming back to what I just said about the outer limits of uh, progressive U.S. mainstream. Um, you know, there's plenty of Democratic politicians now and even pundits on, uh, on media outlets who will say that Netanyahu is the problem. We need to replace him. Chuck Schumer himself, Mr. Israel, came out and said that. Well, mm. on the one hand, that's quite something. And I think he's also talking about Ben Gavir and Schmutrich. It's true. The problem is there's no one waiting in the wings who's any better. The entire Israeli political spectrum has moved to the right. And in fact, the reason Netanyahu, a, a big reason this, uh, you know, Netanyahu is keeping this going is that if he was to stop this war, he'd have to go deal with his corruption charges. And the fact, you know, rallying around the cause of avenging October 7th is, is a way he can distract the Israeli public for a while. But the extreme right has him by the by the gonads, you know, he, he, he's in many ways um, beholden to Ben Gvir and Schmotrich and the settler movement. So getting rid of him does not represent going back to some kind of gentler Israel. It could be quite the opposite, which is a scary thought to think that there could be something more brutal and craven than him. Um, mm. So, you know, I really don't know 
Uh, mm. I, I believe him when he says that he's determined to invade Rafa. Um, mm. Who knows when it'll happen? He says there's a date in the calendar. Mm. All I know is the more Israel um, acts out its uh, genocidal id uh, and, and imposes that upon the Palestinians and increasingly on foreign aid workers in Gaza and whoever gets in the way. Mm. The more the more the world is not going to tolerate it anymore. And it won't be about it, Netanyahu being brought down from the inside. It'll be about Israel becoming a pariah state no matter who's in power. I don't mm. think there's anything, any, any going back from this reputationally for Israel. Mm. Mm. The yeah, they're, 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 yeah, they've had a massive hit. We have a couple of minutes left. Um, we didn't talk a lot about your book. Shall we uh, give give you a couple of minutes just to talk briefly about the myth of normal trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture that you wrote with your father for those who are not familiar with the book briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the book's been translated into something like 35 to 40 languages. I wow, there, amazing. I believe, I believe there's an Arabic translation on the way, if I remember correctly. Mm. Um, it's a book that's been, uh, yeah, resonating in a lot of places for a lot of people. And it's a book mainly, I'd say, conceived and primarily authored by my dad, although I co-wrote it with him in the sense of how to execute his ideas and how to, uh, how to frame and structure the story of the book, the argument of it, which is basically that rather than being mysterious aberrations uh, or individual ailments, the exponential rise we've seen in everything from uh, addiction to chronic physical illness, cancer, autoimmune diseases and the like, and mental illnesses, all the health so-called epidemics, well, not so-called, actual epidemics of our time, they're not mistakes and they're not a case of genetic mutation. They are normal, natural responses of the human organism to an unnatural environment. So in fact, not only is normal a myth, abnormal is a myth. People are responding the way the human organism does when it's deracinated, <clears throat> which is to say uprooted from its original evolutionary context, which has to do with shared communality, uh, uh, mutual interdependence, parenting that takes place in the context of a community, uh, a culture of you know, vertical transmission of uh, a culture, myth, story, lore, and connection to the earth. Um, basically, we evolved a certain way, and the modern world under late stage capitalism not that we're advocating for any particular economic system mm. aside from that, although my dad probably calls himself <clears throat> some sort of communist deep down, and I'm not sure what I am, but whatever it is, we're living in the age of increasingly globalized capitalism. That has certain precepts and ideologies about what human beings are, and it just so happens that those views of what human beings are are at odds with how we evolved. We're not actually homo economicus who are individuals uh, who are primarily seeking to extract resources from the earth at whatever cost and to individually get ahead and maximize profit ahead of all other considerations. That's a relatively new phenomenon and it creates certain imperatives to devalue aspects of the culture and elevate others. It creates a world in which human beings can't fully be themselves and it turns out that has a health cost which makes sense if you consider any other organism, you know, if you try to plant an oak tree in the Sahara desert, it, you might get a, a little bit of a shoot sprouting out of the ground if you're lucky, but it's not gonna be much of an oak tree. So every organism is itself by virtue of its environment being intact and we are no different. So the book mm. is a deep dive into the science behind that, everywhere from the, the cellular level outward to the social, economic, and political level, showing the connections between disconnection, conflict, lack of control, 
These are all stressors for human beings, and chronic stress is the biggest predictor of ill health and illness and trauma of all kinds um, are major contributing factors to afflictions of all kinds. So we're looking at the environment in which human beings are currently surviving and coping and existing and drawing the connections between that and the stuff human beings are going through right now at unprecedented levels. And then in the final section of the book, offering a new view of what healing means and some guideposts along the way as people try to go against the grain of the society and become more whole, more connected to themselves and each other. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, Daniel, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in for another show. That's it for now, and we'll see you again in the next episode. Shukran. Afwan.